Good evening, friends. My name is Mike Lewis. It's a joy to be back here for my second P3 talk, my first virtual P3 talk. Um, anyway, last summer I got the privilege to share my vocation story uh, right here before I got um, ready to head off for my uh, year of seminary in Rome. Um, that being said, I'm back from Italy, and after a 14-day quarantine, I'm now living here at St. Charles. Uh, while continuing to take my online classes. So tonight, I want to meditate on one of my favorite passages from Scripture. It's a passage about a journey, um, and we heard it last weekend, um, and that's the road to Emmaus. I'm going to read it here first and um, reflect on it a little bit. Um, try to tie in an experience I had in Rome um, related with St. Peter. So bear, bear with me on all of this. Um, there should be a link to the passage in the description of this video if you want to read along. Um, but it's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other while you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this has happened. Moreover, some of the women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had seen even a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but, he did not, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them who said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. That very day, two of them going to Emmaus and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. If you'll bear with me for a minute, I want you to invite you to prayerfully enter into this scene. So if you're at home, uh, feel free to close your eyes. And we want to just try to imagine what it would have been like for these two disciples. We know one is named Cleopas. The other is not named. So fill in whichever of the disciples of Jesus you want. Maybe it's John. Maybe it's one of the many Marys. I like to imagine it's our old friend Lazarus, the one Jesus raised from the dead less than a year earlier, 
And now it's Lazarus as the one speculating if Jesus will be able to raise himself from the dead. Well, whoever you are imagining, put yourself there with the two of these disciples walking along the road. It is later in the afternoon, approaching sundown, a warm April day in the Middle East. Just two days earlier, we watched our best friend be brutally tortured and killed. As the scripture said, they stood still looking sad. Among these disciples here, there's been a heaviness the past couple days. The hopes of our Messiah to save the people seem all but lost. And yet, since this morning, there's been a buzz in the air. Early that morning, some of our friends went to the tomb. The stone was rolled away and the body was gone. Could it be? What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? A man approaches, his body silhouetted against the setting sun. He looks familiar, but none of us can put a name to him. He must not be from around here, Cleopas concludes. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? How could he not know what was going on? All of Jerusalem was aroar with the news. The man innocently asks, what things? And Lazarus goes on to explain, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, he was condemned and crucified. We had hoped that he was the one. And yet some of the women went to the tomb. There were angels who said he was alive. Before Lazarus can get his last words out, the mysterious man cuts in. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And the man continued on to open up the prophets and the scriptures, teaching everything that had come to fulfillment in Jesus. Stay with us, Cleopas exclaims, wanting to learn more as the man prepares to part ways. And he does. He comes into the guest house where we are staying and joins us for a meal still continuing to open the prophecies of Scripture that seemed so veiled before. As we prepare to dine, he took the lead, taking the bread, blessing it with an unusual blessing that is generally reserved for the Passover meal, and he breaks it. As we raise our eyes from taking our first bite, he was gone. The three of us look at each other with amazement. It was him. He lives, Jesus. Tears pour from Lazarus' eyes. Cleopas is frozen with both shock and utter joy. I make it to the door first, and we're off, racing back to Jerusalem as the sun sets over the Temple Mount. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the Scriptures? We'll go ahead and end the passage here, this meditation. If you had your eyes closed this whole time, you can open them. But what a story this is. Jesus is alive. He eats. He walks. He speaks with them. There's so much to reflect on here. But I think the last line is what stood out to me the most. Did not our hearts burn within us while he opened to us the Scriptures? What is this Scripture but the Word of God? And what is the Word of God but the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ? The Word became flesh. As my fellow seminary Tim taught me, the Word of God assumes a real human nature. And this Word of God walked with the disciples on the road, making sense of the very scriptures of which he himself was the sacred author. And this authentic encounter with Christ happens not so much from the disciples seeing Jesus with their eyes. With their physical eyes, they could not recognize him. But with the eyes of their hearts, enlightened by grace. Pope Francis, in his apostolic letter, instituting the Sunday of the Word of God, reflects on this very passage. The scene clearly demonstrates the unbreakable bond between sacred scripture and the Eucharist. As the Second Vatican Council teaches, the Church has always venerated the divine scriptures as she has venerated the Lord's body. The Pope goes on, we should always keep in mind the teaching found in the book of Revelation, 
the Lord is standing at the door and knocking. If anyone should heed his voice and open for him, he will come in and eat with him. Christ Jesus is knocking at our door in the words of sacred scripture. If we hear his voice and open the doors of our minds and our hearts, then he will enter our lives and remain with us forever. I think the Pope's words are particularly potent for today, a day when many of us do not have access to the sacraments, where we don't get to come and adore the veiled presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. That is true. But we do have the presence of Jesus right here among us. As close as he was to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he is present in the words of Scripture sacramentally as we read and meditate on them. No better time than this to find our Lord who is right here in front of us, to speak to him as one friend speaks to another, to listen to his words written 2,000 years ago that are more alive now than ever. And this story on the road to Emmaus reminds me of a similar story in the life of St. Peter, which is many years after the resurrection. So during my first week in Rome last summer, As part of our orientation, we visited a number of churches throughout the city. And one day as we were heading to the catacombs of St. Sebastian, a place where thousands of early Christian martyrs were buried, we stopped at a small church in the southeast of Rome, right off the Appian Way, a road built back in the 300s BC. And the name of this church was Chiesa del Domine Quo Vadis, And maybe you know the story, but it's the story of St. Peter, who after escaping prison in Jerusalem, as described in Acts chapter 12, went to Rome to preach the gospel. And Rome, being the center of the world at a time, a place where goods and art and culture went out to the ends of the earth, both Peter and Paul knew that if the gospel were to be successful here, if the great Roman Empire were to come to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then the whole world would have a shot at redemption. And so Peter and Paul preached, and they were immediately persecuted. Yet through trials, they continued for years, until at last Emperor Nero, who with a burning hate for these little Christs, blamed the great fire of Rome on the Christians and sought to put them to death. Peter, who had been made the head of the church, seeking to to preserve this head, preserve the papacy, you know, given the keys to the kingdom by Christ himself, he fled from Rome. He took off along the Appian Way. And it was here that St. Peter encountered a man. On the Appian Way, Peter met his old friend, his fishing partner, the one he denied so vehemently years earlier and yet the one who forgave him with so much love right after. Peter met Jesus walking in the opposite direction, walking towards Rome, carrying a cross. Peter cried out, Domine quo vadis, Lord, where are you going? Jesus lovingly replied, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. And Jesus walked on, Immediately two verses that Jesus had spoken long ago came to Peter's mind. The first, get behind me, Satan. This verse Peter originally took as a rebuke when Peter tried to stop the Lord from being crucified way back when. But this time the verse had a whole new meaning. Jesus was not telling Peter to get lost, to get get behind me, get out of here. But rather, when he was saying that, he was being literal. Get behind me. Get behind me. Pick up your cross and follow me. And so Peter knew what he had to do. He went back to Rome to continue to be the visible head of the church here on earth, to be with his fellow Christians, and to give his life for the sake of many. The story goes on about how Peter found, was found, imprisoned, and crucified upside down, not considering himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner as our Lord. It was again at this encounter with Jesus that the scriptures were opened to Peter. 
he came to see the full meaning of what was spoken to him many years earlier, what he would have read many times in the suffering servant passages of Isaiah and many other of the Old Testament scriptures. So in both of these stories, of Peter and the road to Emmaus, the disciples come to see the significance of the events they have witnessed. What is interesting is that when Cleopas described the events that had happened in Jerusalem during the last days, he does so almost as if it's just a news announcement, a report devoid of the charismatic pronouncement of the resurrection. Yes, they know something's different, but it's only when Jesus open the, opens their mind on the road and their eyes to the scriptures and the breaking of the bread that they understand that Jesus is alive and has won over death and sin. It is amazing how down to earth this story is. And we see the process by which the first believers actually learned to understand the significance of the events they had witnessed. And Peter too came to see that his life was not his own. The death is not the end, but part of the journey to everlasting life with the one who is life itself. Lord, where are you going? This question that Peter asked Jesus is a template of prayer and discernment for us. At a time when travel is restriction and walking down the roads are not as surreal as they would have been to Emmaus, we can still ask the Lord the same question. Where are you going today, Lord? Where do you want me to follow you? Who do you want me to speak to today? Who needs a phone call? When so much seems limited, what are you leading me to do this day? with this time, and not only in this day, but in the big picture as well. Where are you going, Lord, after this time of crisis ends? What have I learned from these events? Bring these questions to the Lord. Pray with sacred scripture. Let the Lord lead you during this time and after we come out of it. Lord, maybe I was heading to Jerusalem and now I need to go back. Where does the Lord want you to change direction? What does it mean for you to pick up your cross and follow him as Peter does? In the style of meditation I did on the road to Emmaus earlier, letting the scripture come to life, this is a style of Lectio Divina that St. Ignatius calls composition of place, and I commend it to you in your own prayer. It's where you just allow the Lord to place yourself in the scene of the gospel. St. Ignatius encourages us to really imagine the scene, to bring it to our image, use our senses. What did it look like to be on the road? What was the sound of Jesus' voice? Imagine what it was like to feel the rocks they walked on and the smell of the bread baking that was used for the meal. Scripture is alive because Jesus is alive, and the Holy Spirit lives in us and prays in our behalf. And so all of these questions, everything we're reflecting on, they don't lead us to this hopeless despair, not looking sad as the disciples did on the road, or full of anxiety as I'm sure Peter was when he was fleeing from Rome, but with joy. We're not our hearts burning within us. When we come to authentically recognize Jesus in the midst of the chaos of our lives, our hearts cannot help but burn with joy a joy that abides and exceeds all expectation. And so we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Peter, pray for us. Thank you for joining for the meditation, and if you're still free, uh, there's a Zoom link in the description below for some virtual pub time. So grab yourself a drink, uh, be prepared for some awkwardness, and we'll see you soon.